This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. One of the issues I've wanted to uh, discuss in these podcasts is the question of uh, social reproduction. And this is a question which uh, has been hovering around in Marxist circles for some time, since the 1960s, 1970s. And recently, there's been a great deal of uh, explosion, really, of interest and writings about it. And I thought it would be very good if uh, today we could uh, have some help in discussing this question with my good friend, Cindy Katz, who, like me, is a geographer, uh, is at the City University of New York, in the Graduate Center, and uh, we've known each other for this whole long period. So I thought it would be really good to ask you just to start out a little bit about your history uh, of working on on this topic. Okay. Um, Well, I realize in certain ways that I've been interested in this topic since 10th grade when I wrote my 10th grade. So I I know we're not going to go back that far. I didn't know you were in 10th grade. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but I wrote about collective child care. So, you know, it wasn't something that I thought of as social reproduction. But for me, I, I have been interested as a Marxist feminist in the questions of how do we remake um, the conditions of capital accumulation, but also the conditions of everyday life. How do people um, engage in the everyday activities of producing people on a daily basis, but in a, on a, in a generational way, and the conditions in which they work? I mean, that's sort of the nutshell definition. But um, it. Uh, I mean, it goes back to a kind of primordial text by Maria Rosa della Costa and Selma James about women and the um, and social reproduction and the subversion of the community. Because if we are engaged in making the knowledge and the conditions and the people who inhabit any social formation, we have the power as social actors to change those conditions and to change what it means to be a worker, what it means to be a partner, what it means to be in a domestic or in a social and cultural situation. So um, that's always appealed to me. And as a as a feminist in a um, engaged in debates with Marxists, I've I've felt for a very long time, for as long as we've known each other, that organizing at the sh- on the shop floor was inadequate. And I think one of the reasons there's a burgeoning of of um, work now on social reproduction is that question is is more and more paramount. Well, one of the other issues which is coming up a lot is the whole kind of question of care, care for older people and care for sick people and the like and. And you know what kind of work is that? And so the mm-hmm. whole kind of uh, idea that uh, work does not stop at the boundary of the factory. In fact, there's a whole world of uh, hard work uh, out there, and it needs to be analysed and incorporated. Yes, and one of the ways that um, the early kind of Marxist feminists who worked on social reproduction, and, and in a continuing way, is that that care work is a subsidy to capitalists that producing children and and workers in you know in an everyday way is unrecognized as labor or and that it it allows for uh, cheapening the social wage or cheapening the wage and so there's always been a struggle um, for who pays for social reproduction and I've kind of thought of it not just me, but I've thought of it as capital through the workplace, the state, the people in the household or the individual, and civil society or non-governmental organizations. And that that, um, set of who provides for it or who pays for it is a struggle. That's a lot of what worker struggles have been like over the 20th century is uh, is to get capital to pay for more of it or to increase the notion of what it means to be a prepared worker so that it increases the level of education, it increases 
the paying for health care. And a lot of what's happened in recent years with neoliberalism and the globalization of production is that capital has pushed back on on who's on paying for that social wage. And that's the kind of uh, the neoliberal approach to, to all of this. And I think that it might be interesting to look a little bit more at uh, the question of uh, social reproduction from the standpoint of austerity politics mm-hmm. and, and the like. And one of the issues that uh, crops up, for example, in Marx's analysis of the labor process is uh, the great emphasis he has on the Industrial Reserve Army. The, uh, then the question is, how does the Industrial Reserve Army survive when it has no means of support? And that means that people themselves have to find way, and that then, if you like, this uh, creates a, a shift of, of who is going to look after what mm-hmm. uh, in in this di- in the in the capitalist dynamic. And that, and as the social relations of production change, and in many ways, fewer workers are required to accomplish production on a global scale. Mm. There's a, a disinvestment in reproducing. Uh, a, a social formation at any scale, and that disinvestment it doesn't. It, it we can call it the industrial reserve army, but there's a whole groups of people who are excessed from possible futures, and who that excess has to be managed yeah. in some way. And so, part of the work of of um, people involved in social reproduction is finding ways to survive under those conditions, but the excessing of populations who have to be contained, you know, and I, I certainly that management, waste management is a, is yeah. costs a lot and is profitable. Yeah. And yet, so prison, you know, we all know that it costs more to incarcerate somebody for a year than to educate them for a year. But somehow that arena of social reproduction is invested in by mm. the state mm but also leaving people to violent ends, to drug use, to yeah. kind of wasting themselves yeah. under these conditions. Now, but now early on, you, you did a lot of work uh, on children and uh, wrote a book, uh, Growing Up Global, uh, in which uh, you were looking at uh, children growing up in Sudan and also in New York City and mm-hmm. how you might uh, connect the lives of those very disparate groups. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what animated that book. And <laughs> That book, was, as you know, was a long time in coming. Uh, many things animated it along many years. But um, And my work still involves looking at children and childhood, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. That What I wanted to see was what happens when a mode of production in a rural area, in this case in, in northern central Sudan, Arabic-speaking Sudan, is transformed by an agricultural de- development project. So when a subsistence area is incorporated into um, cash cropping, much more involved in the global capitalist economy and and engaged in that by the state with international support. This particular agricultural project was funded by Kuwait and, and Japan and the U.S. And I wanted to see what happens when the political ecology, the environment changes so drastically yeah. from cash, from subsistence growing of sorghum and sesame to delineated tenancies of 10 acres each in which there were a fixed number allocated to this village where I worked. And the children were learning how to farm and how to graze animals and how to use local resources, forestry in particular. But that whole political ecology was under erasure by virtue of this um, agricultural project. And the average household had five children, and people have children at a very young age, so that there wasn't even a, a likely possibility for inheriting a tenancy. So I wanted to see what what happens in those un, under those conditions, and saw that as a central question of social reproduction. And what was happening was they were being de-skilled for the 
possible futures that they were likely to have. And the project, in fact, involved more work from children than less because of environmental degradation, so that they were going to school less often with less frequency. And I thought, if this is development, we're really in trouble. But um, but I so there were two things that then happened. I wanted to see what happened to them as they came of age, and I was um, amazed and surprised to see the ways they hadn't migrated to cities as kind of the lumpen proletariat with no skills to work in cities, but instead turning your idea of space time compression uh, inside out and talking about space time expansion. I saw that people were doing what they used to do, but in a vastly expanded area. So they were cutting trees for charcoal production um, 200 kilometers from their homes, and they were grazing animals 50 kilometers away. So it was this huge expanded field that couldn't last forever, but it did enable people to use that knowledge that they had acquired in their childhoods. But I didn't want to leave it as like, this is what happens to them over there. And I had enough concerns about doing work in a rural area in Sudan. So I looked at working class kids in New York and what was happening in uh, in the 80s with, right. I thought of it as de-industrialization, but I was corrected and now called then so that it was post-Fordism. But what was happening was the economy was changing so much that kids who were school leavers or who had minimal skills, educational skills, were being displaced from a a, a high-end service economy, and they were not being able to be incorporated in in the economy. And I thought, this is a way to think about global economic uh, restructuring or globalization that differs completely from... um, thinking of globalization as just capital flows. And so to think what, ha- if you look at what happens to kids and to reproducing um, a social body, this is a way to understand the mo- movement of capital quite differently. Yeah, but can you elaborate a bit further on that? I mean, because I think uh, some of the ideas you had about that, the counter topography oh, yeah. kind of idea, and everything was a uh, did something very important, which is to say that we often think about social reproduction just occurs over there. But mm-hmm. what you're doing is sort of saying, well, actually, there's a whole system, there's a system, if you like, and 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 seemingly very disparate parts of the world are are, are echoing each other mm-hmm. and related to each other in certain ways. <laughs> yeah. So one of the moves of this project was to put together these two sites as a place where de-skilling was occurring and where a certain kind of dispossession was occurring. And to say, uh, and to take this idea of uh, topography, it's a, there's a long backstory and I won't tread into that, but basically I'd been invited to a conference where the session was called Topographies of Race and Gender, a nice sexy title that means nothing. But I decided to look at what what is a topography? And topographies are descriptions of place and the place itself, and thought about uh, topographic maps and thought that the contour lines connect places of equal elevation without measuring every single site. And so I thought if you could make contour lines that connect de-skilling in places as different as rural Sudan and, and urban U.S., and, and many other sites in between, but not every site. Mm-hmm. But then you could connect other places in, around questions of, say, displacement, and not just the displacement of gentrification, but displacement because of pipeline development, that then you have can build a map of connection that moves across space in the way that capital moves across space and can build, in my great you know, hopeful imagination, build social movements that are translocal and transnational and 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 not homogenizing and not does that it, yeah, no, no, I mean it's uh, there there are, there are many, I think groups around right now who would want to try to make those connections, but I think finding the vehicles, yes, to make those connections was sometimes very difficult, and I think what was so interesting about that. That that uh, system you were 
exploring was precisely that it allowed a way of thinking, a mode of thinking, which mm -hmm. actually emphasized the connectivities and didn't say, well, you know, in Sudan it's like that and over here it's like that. It was, well, actually everybody's being dis dispossessed. Yeah. And in a sense, that's what the whole neoliberal project was all about, was dispossession yeah. <laughs> all around uh, the all world, everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> and, you, and if you started to put it in those terms, then then this was this was uh, this was integrating, if you like, uh, the whole kind of question of social reproduction into uh, the dynamics of uh, of, of capitalism. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the, how you see the relationship between social reproduction and uh, the transformation in labor processes and things of that kind. Well, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but another way that I think that kind of global mobility. Uh, comes into play in it, around social re reproduction is that there's, as capital and as production in particular has become global and much more mobile and there's multiple factory sites and there's not a kind the same sort of commitment to place, to right. any one place. And um, there's the global car. The, you know, you cannot rely on the, the automotive companies to sustain Detroit because they can get their parts and things from other places with um, more lax environmental laws and much cheaper social reproduction because the cost of living and the cost of housing and the cost of education is, is cheaper. And so there's migration can be seen as a kind of transfer of variable capital, if we want to speak in those terms, is that people who are produced in Mexico or in mm. you know uh, rural parts of South America are skilled and trained and educated and fed and, and clothed by um, families and households and states that are that are much it, it, at much lower cost right, than right, here so right. that there can be a disinvestment in education which we've seen I mean the neoliberal move is to say you take care of this yeah. you know and the whole idea I've been calling this social childhood I mean if we think about it as you know, which there used to be, and I don't want to get all romantic about Fordist capitalism, but there was a sense that the future was a social shared possible right. project. And if we, even if many people fell by the wayside, there was a commitment to educating a population and having um, the the means to, to have a, a decent life. I mean, and part of that is worker struggles, that's for sure, and, and feminist struggles. But um, as that has changed, the idea of social childhood just seems to me now to mean other people's children. And every and the and the notion of neoliberal privatization works its way into people's everyday lives in the ways that people who can afford to get private education get at you know get their yeah, children educated right, that way right. so that the way social reproduction figures into the current moment or which is a long lasting moment yeah. um is in many ways about the withdrawal of support by the state and by capital from social reproduction and that's going on at the very moment when uh, deindustrialization is actually uh, diminishing the capacity of the mass of the labor force mm -hmm. to actually provision itself. So on the one hand, it, it's, it's losing its power, market power to, to, to sort of, uh, I don't know, feed the kids and send them to school, this kind of stuff, at the very moment when the state is kind of saying, well, you're all on your own. Exactly. So it was that thing that actually I think has put in a, in a way set up a, a crisis in, in the realm of social reproduction with incredible stresses uh, internally. Absolutely. I mean, that, I, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I just, and it, of course, it's very hard to, to get into social reproduction very far without getting up into questions of what is a household, family, what do we mean by family, what does it mean to talk about, you know, communal work, you know, processes, and, and can you speak a little bit about all of that? Oh, sure. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, first of all, the notion of what is a family or a household is itself a question of social reproduction. Yes. You'll, you'll see that for me, everything is social reproduction, but in many ways, 
it is. Yeah. So that what how we constitute what is a normal household or what is a family or what how do we feed, clothe, and take care of future generations is a heteronormative idea. It's completely classed and racialized. And the, and the ways around under these conditions might be to share, you know, to have extended families. I mean, I was just at this workshop on adolescence in Africa, and the idea of the extended family being able to absorb many mm -hmm. more of mm -hmm. these these sorts of shocks are, you know, is something that we've offloaded uh, onto individual households and. Pre and the pressure on the, the kind of heteronormative nuclear family is huge. But there's also a sense of where does the labor to sustain it come from? So that, I mean, the, the more global question of social reproduction is it, we see so much labor migration. So that there is, and there's, that's a lot where the racialized questions and the inequalities among countries come from, it, that we have domestic laborers who come to the global north and to work in um, wealthier households, but even upper middle class households, um, as relatively cheap labor because they come as lone migrants for the most part, and their children and their households are being sustained by their extended families in, a, in again in a stressed yeah, and dis right. and disinvested state. And by having domestic labor who can help privileged families, the gender division of labor doesn't really change. And the kind of exploitation that's translocal and goes across um, national boundaries is enormous. But there's incredible transfers of wealth in that yeah, way right. around the household. Right. And that stabilizes the kind of heteronormative how you know white household and that doesn't that leads to having um a sets of struggles around like redefining the the household and domestic labor and how it could get accomplished and i don't know if we want to get into this now but we don't need to have the work week we have no i mean that's the you know the current the way of displacing so many people from any sort of work is um, because we have 19th century work, you know, the working day, which yeah. has been a, a place of great struggle, is still a basic eight hour working day, a 40 hour week with machines that are doing so much with, you know, technology that could displace lots of, that has displaced lots of workers. So why not shorten the, the working week um, with decent sa decent yeah, salary right, and a living wage, right. and employ more people. I mean, it, this is not revolutionary, but it's a lot better than what we have. Is right, to no, have a twenty five hour working week and more and more people who are working, and then my favorite one of my favorite concepts of Marx is disposable time. Yes. But I kind of framed it in relation to disposable people. You want disposable people, or you want disposable time where people. Do all those things that great paragraph in Marx, or you know, when you can fish and paint and do all these things yeah. that, in fact, require consumption, and therefore would employ more people. But one of the ironies, I think, is that uh, we have a tremendous amount of uh, labor-saving and time-saving equipment, and household technologies have actually <laughs> blossomed in a way. But if you ask people, do you have more disposable time, the answer is less. Yes. And, and this reminds me of, Marx actually said this about you know, John Stuart Mill and, and, and machinery, that John Stuart Mill couldn't understand why it was that machinery had not lightened the load of labor. And, and so I have the same question about these household technologies. How come all these new household technologies have not lightened the load and, 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 and actually have taken up people's time yeah. rather than releasing it? Yeah. No, there's some really good books about that by Ruth Cohen and Susan Strasser, old books that show that every form of technology that's entered the household has not decreased the labor but increased the sense of what needs to be done, yes. you know, so you can have washing machines instead of scrub boards, but then you think that you should have clothes that are 
whiter than white and right. washed all right. the time. Right. And I think this is uh, actually one of the paradoxes and the, of, the, of the current uh, era, because you're quite right. If we wanted to organize life in a different way, uh, we probably could uh, do extremely well on 20 hours a week. And, mm -hmm. and then everybody does what they like the rest of the time. And would be healthier and, yes. happy, you know, <laughs> and doing what they like would right. lead to more kind of jobs. Okay. So, so on that uh, hopeful note, yeah. why don't we stop here and uh, we'll continue this uh, in the That's next... Uh, we ended with hope. Yes, we'll <laughs> continue this in the next time. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.